Hi, I'm Paul from Trending Who, What, Where, and When. Today I will be talking with J.M. Frey, award-winning author. J.M. Frey will be joining us from Toronto, Canada. Hi, I'm science fiction and fantasy author J.M. Frey, and I live in Toronto, Ontario, home of Scott Pilgrim, last year's NBA champions, the Raptors, Drake, the Toronto International Film Festival, and the tallest freestanding building in North America right there, the CN Tower. Trending WWW being a luxury travel guide, you sent us an extensive list of really nice places in Toronto that you would take family and friends to when they come to visit. When I picked them up, probably at Union Station because that was the the original nexus of the Grand Trunk Railway uh, in Canada, but now it is the home of the GO Train and um, the Toronto transit system, I would pick them up at that beautiful cathedral to travel, um, as Prince Philip once called it, uh, and show them around the actual station itself because it's, it's just got marvelous architecture. And then I would walk us down to the waterfront, which isn't too far away. Um, it's all reclamated land, so it's very fascinating to see what they've done with it. Um, and just take a, a walk along the waterfront because Toronto Harbour is absolutely beautiful. Um, and I would actually take us all the way out to Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport. There's a free ferry. It's the shortest commuter ferry in the world. It's just under 90 seconds. Um, <laughs> and the, but it, the airport's on an island. So until they built the tunnel underneath uh, the, the harbour for the Pan Am Games, Uh, There was literally no other way to get to the island. You had to take that 90-second ferry or swim. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could hold your luggage above your head. But you can walk around the airport and some of the grounds there, and it's just really some of the most beautiful scenery of the city you'll ever see because you can turn around and look back at the skyline, or you can just sit on a picnic table and watch all the planes take off. I would then have us jump on the other ferry at Jack Layton Terminal and head up to the Toronto Islands for a nice picnic and then come back uh, to the downtown core and maybe go see the Ripley's Aquarium or head up to Casa Loma, which is a castle that was built by an industrialist at the beginning of last century and now is uh, owned and operated by Toronto. If you've watched um, X-Men or the Umbrella Academy or Scott Pilgrim's uh, versus the world, Casa Loma features, features in all of those. Mm. And, um, and then we would go up the CN Tower for dinner in Restaurant 360, which is really cool because uh, the CN Tower used to be the the tallest freestanding structure in the world. And then a building, I believe, in Kuala Lumpur beat the record. And But it's still beautiful uh, views of the city. You can see all the way out to the harbor on a clear day. You can see all the way to Niagara Falls. You can actually see the mist rising above the falls and maybe even a rainbow and a really clear day. Sometimes you can kind of see New York State across the water um and it's just beautiful beautiful food all canadian inspired so a lot of maple syrup a lot of salmon a lot of wild blueberries and the um the wine cellar is the highest wine cellar in the world i am an absolute massive advocate for the beautiful niagara peninsula wine that we make the cool climate chardonnay produced in the bench is I'm sorry, it's better than California, deal with it. It goes all the way from just north of Windsor, Ontario. So about two hours drive north of Detroit, um, around uh, the lake, and then sort of you know, obviously stops where Toronto is, and then keeps going into an area called Prince Edward County. And the reason for this is because um, when the, the last ice age, the glaciers uh, were scraping the topsoil off of basically the rest of Canada and pushing it south. And, uh, and that's why we have the Canadian Shield because it's all just exposed bedrock at that point. And the glacier pushed it all south and the glaciers kind of ended where the Great Lakes are now, which is why the Great Lakes exist. Um, and then when the glaciers receded, they left that rich, thick deposit of topsoil from all over the continent in this massive berm basically called the Niagara Escarpment Um, and south of just below the escarpment um, is all that fertile topsoil so the the um, humid air comes in from the lakes and it hits the escarpment and it comes back down and it 
lands on top of the grapes. So we have, it's kind of the only place in, um, in this side of Canada, because um, the Okanagan Valley in, in um, British Columbia is the northern version of what they have in California. But it's kind of the only area in this part of Canada where we can grow stone fruit, grapes, um, soft fleshed fruits, and there's beautiful orchards, amazing tomatoes. Um, French's ketchup is made from Niagara tomatoes um, or Ontario tomatoes. But that's why you get these amazing grapes. And then because we have the mix of the cool climate and the, um, the, the lake effect water, uh, which gives uh, uh, those areas around the lake a much more mild winter. Um, it's, it's just perfect conditions for growing, for growing mm -hmm. wine. Access that fairly easily. That's close to where, you, where you're located. Yes, yeah. So I can drive to um, Prince Edward County in about two hours, and I can drive to Niagara. I mean, I can drive about, so, so first off, Toronto is one hour's drive away from Toronto. <laughs> to start on one end of Toronto and drive to the other end of Toronto, or the, the GTA is what we call it, the Greater Toronto Area, it will probably take you an hour and a half to literally just drive across the city, nothing else. Um, and so just outside of both of those regions is where you're going to start seeing the first of the orchards and wineries. But to get to the concentrated wine areas, yeah, Prince Edward County is about a two, three hour drive, depending on which wineries you're going to. Um, and then the Niagara region, uh, the, the main Niagara on the lake area is about an hour 45 from where I live. I didn't grow up in Toronto. So I grew up in a, an extremely small, tiny community of, when I lived there about, I think it was just 15,000 people. Um, like our high school was, was pretty much equal to the population of the town because they would bust in all the farm kids. Um, actually, so many people were bused in from my high school that if buses were canceled due to snow, you just didn't go to school because most of the teachers couldn't even drive in. Um, you just, you know, you would have been like the only person there, so you just didn't go. Um, but uh, I, I grew up in this very small community called Fergus, and uh, it was founded um, 200 years ago or something like that, uh, by, um, Adam Webster, Adam Ferguson and John Webster from, uh, Scotland. Uh, they came and they purchased land and, um, built this beautiful limestone quarry little town that has stayed pretty Scottish Presbyterian hmm. ever since. Um, and actually two weekends ago would have been the 75th anniversary of the Fergus Highland Scottish Festival in Highland Games, which is the second largest in North America, I believe. Oh. Um, but again, unfortunately, it was canceled this year for reasons. Um, but they did this wonderful digital online Kaylee that I really enjoyed. And they got their usual performers, Albanac and the Red Hot Chili Pipers and I'm trying to think of who else. Steel City Rovers? I don't know. I, I'm not entirely sure who was there, but, you know, some of my favorite acts from the past. Um, performing from their own living rooms and things like that. So they, they did really do their best to, to, to really capture the spirit of the Highland Games. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah. But the, the, yeah, the place where I grew up was just really tiny and um, very, very art centric. There was choirs and dance and children's drama clubs and things like that, as well as fantastic sports. I believe two or three of the people my brothers grew up with now play in the NHL. Um, so yeah, really, there's something in the water in Fergus Alora. You want your kids to, to grow up artistic and talented. You, you, Probably a good place to grow up. Yeah, and it, it was very isolated. I mean, we had to drive 45 minutes to get to the nearest cinema if you ever wanted to watch a film. But um, there was something nice about that. You had to find other ways to entertain yourself. I see from what we sent you, it looks like you have a long explanation of how your writing career began and how it evolved into being published. So, so basically what happened is uh, in the year 1990, when I was <laughs> years old, I, uh, I discovered something called fan fiction. And right around then, a Canadian television series called Dracula the Series was on the air. Um, along with another series called Forever Night. And I was just absolutely in these. And my, my school finally got dial-up internet. And uh, I was allowed to kind of play on it, 
during lunch breaks and stuff. And I discovered this stuff called fan fiction, which obviously has been around for, you know, um, hundreds of years. People have been telling, re-retelling stories, but uh, fan fiction as we know it has really took off in the 50s and 60s. Um, and, and from there, I just, I started writing fan fiction and uh, it was a really fun hobby and it was nothing I was ever going to do professionally. Um, I was a child actor at the time. And uh, then I, um, I, I went to theater school, I went to acting school and uh, I still wrote fan fiction all the way through this. Um, but my idea was that I was going to be an actor and then a playwright when I hit 35 and they stopped hiring me as an actor. Um, and, uh, and then I moved overseas to teach for a little while. And while I was overseas, I got hit by a car um, and it crushed my knee. And I, that put paid to kind of the acting thing because now I can't, I can't dance anymore. I can't like stand around on set for a long time. I can't stand around on stage for a long time. So while I was wallowing in my self pity, a friend said, well, you're a really good writer. Like your, your fan fiction is fantastic. Why don't you try to write something original, maybe this is somewhere, this is a direction your creativity can go in. And I was like, ah, okay, writing's hard, but okay. And uh, my first fully original novel uh, was what eventually became Triptych. So I guess I wasn't bad at it because my debut novel got me an agent, uh, was named one of Publishers Weekly Best Books of the Year in 2011, nominated for two Lambda Literary <laughs> Awards. So that's kind of how I got into original writing. I still love fan fiction and I still write it for fun. Um, but after Triptych, uh, it was just, I, I sort of realized that this is something that I'm good at and this is something that I could, I could pursue in lieu of the acting. And then of course the funny thing is um, I continued to voice act because you can do that while sitting. And, uh, and I, I literally just signed with uh, my new voice acting agent like two weeks ago. Oh, really? Yeah. You do that for movies? Uh, mostly up till now, it's been phone trees and uh, commercial jingles and mm -hmm. in-store spots and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of audio drama. Uh, I think I voiced a cartoon character once, um, but now that I have the agent, hopefully, you know, Disney, come calling. What inspired you to write The Untold Tale? I'll do, I'll do the short version of this. Basically, okay. I did not grow up in a family of readers. Uh, so no one at any point in my childhood really handed me a book and said, you should read this, or I read this at your age, I want to share this experience with you. Um, and, and I don't believe that, I mean, past picture books, I don't really recall my parents ever reading to me. So the fact that I'm such a big reader is kind of an anomaly, I guess. Um, and everything I found, I had to find myself. So when I realized I really liked fantasy, I, I just read whatever our very, very, very small hometown library or very, very, very small high school library had. So I had never heard of Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. I had never heard of the Shannara Chronicles. I'd never heard of Song and Ice and, of Ice and Fire. They just, they never passed my radar um, because either they were always out if my library had them and I never got them or they didn't carry them. So when Game of Thrones came out, I was like, this is a thousand percent up my alley. How come I've never heard of this before? And I tried to read the first book and I really, Martin hit my number one pet peeve and that is if you're going to have a multiple POV novel, each different person's internal monologue should sound different. The way that I construct sentences and the way you construct sentences in your own head are completely different. So I read Bran's chapter, it's the first chapter of the first book, and then I flipped it and I think Jamie Lannister is the second chapter. And I was like, this sounds like the exact same person. I, I can't close my eyes, pick up a Martin novel, point, read the sentence and go, oh, well, that's clearly Cersei. Oh, that's clearly Daenerys. Um, so I kind of rage quit the novels, but when the show came out, I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna try this. And I started watching it and I got through season one and I was marathoning it with a friend of mine. 
Um, and we started season two and I was like, you know, what? I think I'm tapping out. I, this is just not doing it for me. And he and I had a discussion which got uh, louder and more aggressive the more we talked about how frustrating it is to be a, a, a female fantasy fan in a world where fantasy is only written for straight white men and how it felt to never be the target audience and for everything to have to go through the male gaze and for nothing to be about me and and the only role that i could possibly have in these worlds because these worlds over tolkien and martin and 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 jordan and they, they teach me over and over again that my only value in one of these worlds is to pop out heroes to be raped or to die horribly in order to uh, inspire the hero's journey to be fridged. Um, and that's not good enough for me. And uh, in a fit of rage after this very loud discussion, I went back to my office and I was just like, rrr, rrr, and I wrote this scene about someone exactly like me who has a master's degree, who studied literature, who studied storytelling her whole life standing in one of these fantasy taverns going, listen up, barbarians, Rawr! and giving them a piece of their mind. And uh, it felt very good and it was cathartic and that's all it was gonna be. And then the next morning I read it again and I was like, hmm, is there a story here? I think there's a story here. And that's what was The Untold Tale. So the very first chapter of The Untold Tale that I ever wrote is what is currently chapter 11. Okay, wow. Yeah, and that's the short version. <laughs> Okay, so you were very motivated then. Okay. Cool. Very motivated. Well, and the thing with the series is the first book is about giving voice to the voiceless or forcing space for marginalized voices that are otherwise absent or marginalized. So driving a wedge into the, the, the common fantasy narrative breaking open space and telling a story in that space. That's why we have the beta male overlooked um, little brother, because when you read fantasy, it's never the scholar who's the hero. Um, so Forsyth is kind of my geek everyman. He's, he's the fantasy reader. I wanted to give the male fantasy reader a space in the story. And then I put in Pip, who's um, uh, Asian and um, a woman and a scholar. Um, so I wanted to force space for her and then there's space for queer voices and everything So that's what the first book is about and I ended up doing an entire trilogy in four books um, And each book kind of takes one of those tropes of fantasy and, and flips it on his head. So the second book is about legacy series where it's the child's story instead of the parents you pick up the book and it's about their children so I wanted to discuss legacy in fantasy for that one and then the third book is about fans and fandom and um fan entitlement and uh uh, uh creator engagement I, I mean i think it you're Maybe not supposed to pick babies but i think it's my favorite book that i've ever written really yeah yeah it's it was the fourth or fifth book of and i've written about 15 books now um i haven't published 15 but i've written about 15 of them and i definitely think that the untold tale is like it's my golden child. Okay, because I was looking that looked like that one did not win awards, but other ones did. And I thought, what what do you have to do to win an award if this one did not win one? Because it, it was good. Well, thank you very much. Would there be any follow-up books to this book? Yes, yeah. So the, the Accidental Turn series is The Untold Tale, The Forgotten Tale, The Silence Tale. And then the fourth book, um, because I like to pretend I'm Douglas Adams sometimes, uh, is a, a collection of short stories, um, deleted scenes from the original work. Um, so what I ended up doing is while there's the main trilogy, uh, I also wrote four novellas, or sorry, three novellas that take place from the point of view of a, a secondary character, Bevel Dom, if you've read the books. Mm -hmm. um, so it's what happens between those books from Bevel's point of view. Um, so I have those novellas, they're included in the collection. Um, without giving away too many spoilers, in the third book,
book, um, there's a short film that the author of uh, The Tales of Kintyre Turn writes. So in order to be able to describe it accurately um, in the books, I ended up just writing the 20 page short film. Uh, so the full script for the short film is in that collection. Things, just a bunch of stuff like that. So then some people might start with the first book and read all the way through. Yeah, well, that's what they should do. Yeah, because the the stuff that's in the fourth book, um, while it's set between all the other books, you really need the context of books one, two, and three before you can understand what Bevel's talking about. Because I, I don't like to spoon feed my readers. I firmly believe that my readers are smart people. They wouldn't be reading fantasy if they weren't engaged, clever, forward thinking people who understand that that writers of fantasy speak in metaphor. So I don't believe in saying, okay, open up, here's what's happening now. Um, so Bevel's stories, he never kind of contextualizes or situates them. He just starts telling the story. And from context clues, you'll understand where that part of the story takes place. Um, so in order to have those context clues, yes, you have to read book one, book one, two, and three first. Even with the one I read, I, I realized I needed to pay attention. Some books you can just breeze through and not know, you know, not miss anything. This one, I thought you really need to pay attention to the details. Yeah, well, it was interesting because um, it's one of those books that I, you kind of have to write it three times. Um, so I sat down and I wrote the A plot, everything that happens with Forsyth and Pip. And then I sat down and I wrote the B plot, which was everything that happens with um, the Viceroy, who's the villain, and Bootstrap, who is his, uh, uh, or Boot Knife, uh, who is his um, second in command. And then I went through and I wrote the C plot stuff, which is everything with Bevel and Kintyre. Um, now, where those characters interacted, obviously, I wrote those all at once, but um, it was one of those books where I would read it specifically to make sure that I had dropped enough clues about Kin and Bev. And then I would read it again to make sure I specifically dropped enough clues about this because this book is kind of like the sixth sense. You're not gonna get everything that happens until you watch the whole thing and then watch the whole thing again. So for me, I wanted to write a book where you have to read the whole book and then go, what? And then go back and read the whole book again. I put a lot of thought into this book. It must have taken you a long time to write this then. Uh, four months. <laughs> really? But I'm going to contextualize that because that sounds very flippant. But I had been writing since 1991. So um, there's a quote, and I believe it was Wayne Gretzky who says it, um, that to be able to even play hockey, you need a thousand hours on the ice just practicing. Right, and they say you have to write 10,000 words or 100,000 words, whatever it is, a million words before you know how to write. So I had been writing a lot. I'd written a lot of fan fiction. I've been doing National Novel Writing Month every single year since 2002. So I've been doing it, I think this year was the 20th anniversary of NaNo, so I've been doing it for 18 years. Um, I've written 15 books, like I've written all that fan fiction, hundreds of thousands of pages of fan fiction. So by the time I sat down to write The Untold Tale, I knew how I liked to write. I knew when I needed to write, what time of day, what kind of environment. Do I need red wine or whiskey? Do I need a candle? Do I need daylight? Do I need, you know, I, I knew what I needed to sit down and write. Um, I had no idea how the book was going to end. I have to admit that. I hadn't plotted it. I had no idea what was going to happen. But also at the same time, I was unemployed. So I was, I had just finished a contract. I was about to start another contract and I had this like six month gap between my two, my two employers. So I, I had literally nothing else to do. Um, and a brand new agent at the time. So a lot of motivation to, to hand her something new and shiny and something that no one had ever done are something that I had never done before. So I had lots of practice, lots of motivation, and lots of time and space to write it. So while four months, ha ha, sounds really flippant, I was writing 10 hours a day. Okay, okay. Because I've heard a lot of people's eight years or 10 years, I hear these stories and... Yeah, my debut novel was, I, I started it when I lived in Japan and I 
I, it was published, it was started in 2006 and it was published in 2011. Okay. So, you know, and I did like 60 drafts of that book. So there's, each book is different depending on how many drafts, like The Untold Tale only needed four drafts. Um, but The Forgotten Tale needed like 30. So it's all, it's all, uh, it all depends on the book and the situation that you're in and the idea that you have at the time and um, how much space you have to write it. 60 drafts, how would you, how would you even do that? I know when we work on some of these videos, we do three and four and five, six times. For me, a draft is anything that I will regret in the morning. So if I write something and then I, you know, like I'm going to change a character's name or I'm going to change this motivation or the character has fried eggs for breakfast. And then I wake up the next morning. I'm like, no crap. The, the character should have pancakes for breakfast because it's a better metaphor for blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a draft. Oh. Even if I'm only going in and changing what the character had for breakfast. If it's anything significant enough that two days later, I might go, no, actually it should be fried eggs because of this. For me, what I call a draft might be a lot more sp splitty hairs, splitting hairs than, than what other people would call a draft. Mm -hmm. But most novels have at least five to 10 drafts. There's the draft you write first, and then there's the draft that you write after you've read what you've written and gone, God, this is terrible, and you write the book again, but better. Um, what's that Neil Gaiman quote? Uh, in the first draft, write down everything that happens. In the second draft, make it look like it was supposed to be that way the whole time, uh, or something like that. Um, so I, you're gonna have at least two drafts. And then you're gonna send it to your beta readers, or your agent, or your editor, or somebody, and they're gonna come back and say, I don't buy this character's motivation, I, there's a plot hole here, you need to fix this, you need to do this. So your secondary readers feedback, so there's draft three. And then usually people are going to send it back to their secondary readers and the secondary readers are going to give another round of feedback. So that's draft five. At that point, um, my agent gets a say, so that's draft six. And then it goes off to the editor and the editor gets a say, so that's draft seven. And then once we're done with the substantive edits with the editor, then the copy editor comes in and is like, you use the word prone when she's lying on her back, so it should be supine. Are we going to change that? So that's draft eight, fixing all of that sort of stuff. And then the proofreader gets it, that's draft nine. And then they put together an advanced reader copy. So it's a book shaped thing, but it's not the final product. It's like the beta product and that's draft 10. So what you buy on the shelf is generally draft 11 for most writers. If they don't split hairs between drafts like I do. That's incredible. Could yeah. A lot of changes. But I wouldn't say it's a change so much as it's just making the book the best version of itself. Mm -hmm. Like you pull a diamond from a piece of rock. There's a lot that has to happen to turn it into a really nice pendant for your necklace. And that's what all this drafting is. It's not other people's ideas and people's fingers in your pie. It's people saying, I see what you're trying to do. I can see the diamond, but right now you need to brush off the dirt. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you've brushed off the dirt. Now you need to shape it. Okay, now you've shaped it. Now you need to polish it. Um, and each one of these stages is another pair of eyes saying, I see what you're trying to do. Let me help you get to the, the purest version of what you're trying to produce. Okay. So that explains why it was so good when the book was finished because so many people did little tiny modifications to make it better. Yes, yeah. Um, I, and it was interesting because when, like my, when my agent read it for the first time, she said, I have four pieces of feedback. Three are spelling <laughs> and one is, um, she didn't know what a kite was, K-I-T-E, which is a kind of, um, uh, prey bird like a raptor so it, they're like falcons or hawks um and she was like i don't know what a kite is i just i'm imagining a child's kite with a string like ben franklin and i was like oh, okay cool um so i just changed the word kite to falcon hmm. okay. that was it those were all the edits from my agent wow. that's good yeah is, is, did i read that your agent it was that your agent that helped you come up with some of the names for people in that book um, it was actually my friend, Stephanie. Okay. 
yeah, Steph's really good at that. And I'll, I'll message her, I'll call her and say, okay, I need a character who is like this. He's like this, he's like this. And she's like, okay, um, this. And I was, okay, all right, I'll use that one. I'll use that one. But the other thing I do is I just pay attention to proper nouns and names around me. Um, so you've, do you know the TV show slash children's picture books, The Magic School Bus? That one I don't know. No, okay. Um, it's maybe it's just a very Canadian upbringing thing, but uh, it was this cartoon that was on when I was a kid, and uh, it's about this um, woman who takes her class on field trips, but the school bus is magic. So like the kids shrink and they go inside Ralphie's body when he has a cold, and they figure and they learn how white blood cells work, um, or they go to a volcano and they learn how lava works. So it's like a science entertainment show. And the main teacher's name is Miss Frizzle. And the, the creator of the Magic School Bus, I believe, lives in my neighborhood, or lived, um, because there's a Frizzle Avenue okay. really close to me. And I was like, oh yeah, I think, I think I remember hearing that that author used the name Frizzle from the avenue. Well, right next to Frizzle Avenue is Kintyre Avenue. And I was like, well, I'm gonna do the same then. So the hero of the Accidental Turn series is Kintyre Turn. So I guess then I would ask you if you have any advice to share with new writers that are having difficulty getting started. I find that new writers don't have any difficulty getting started. What they really have difficulty with is finishing. And I mean, I, again, I know that sounds flippant, but no. um, we all have fa fantastic ideas. We all have no problems saying, I've got this great idea for a story. I've got this great idea for a world. I'm gonna write down this. I'm gonna, I've got the opening line. I have the first chapter. I know what's gonna happen. I know who the villain is. And then you come to them a year later and you're like, so how's the book going? And they're like, I have a great opening chapter. And it's like, okay, but how about chapter 30? How about the ending chapter? Um, and I find that a lot of people get stuck um, at, at, you know, they get three or four or five chapters in and then they're like, oh, this is, this isn't the way I want it to be. It's not matching what's in my head. It's not as beautiful as I want it to be. So the pieces of advice I have for that is A, be crap. Um, your, your first draft is going to suck. Except, no, I'm serious. Except that your first draft is going to suck. Just get it on the page just vomit it onto the page. It doesn't matter how pretty it is or tidy it is, that all comes later. The only thing, the, the first thing you have to do is write it. You can't edit a thing that doesn't exist. The, uh, the other piece of advice that I have is accept the fact that writing is boring. It's so boring. Sitting at your computer for eight hours a day going in the silence alone is boring um but that's okay that's part of writing so find a way to make it engaging for yourself um i have a calendar with gold stickers and if i write 2000 words that day i get a gold sticker i'm still in kindergarten um if i finish a chapter i tell a friend that i did so and we have a little celebration um my writer friends and i check in on one another i do national novel writing month which challenges you to write 50,000 words in a month 50,000 words does not a novel make, but it's the first two thirds of a novel. Um, just find ways to motivate yourself, make deadlines, talk about it publicly with people so you're held accountable. Whatever you can do to, to motivate yourself. And um, you don't have to write the book in order is the other, is the last piece of advice, which helps you deal with the first two issues. There's nothing saying you have to write the book in the order that the events happen. I personally don't. Um, I play Jenga. I'm like, I take this bit from the middle and I put it here and I'm gonna write this bit and I just had a great idea for something that should happen in the climax. So I'm gonna jump to the climax and write that. Um, it was very difficult to do that when I was writing only in Word. I found that a very frustrating process. So now I use a program called Scrivener, which um, is specifically meant for novel writing, people who write novels. And it makes it much easier to move things around and assemble my manuscript like a puzzle. So yeah, accept that writing is boring um, and find a way to motivate yourself. Find a way to mo motivate yourself to not just start it, but to finish it. And n there's nothing saying that you have to write it in order. Figure out the best method for yourself.
I just, I'm really glad to hear that you enjoyed the book. I thought it was really good. I, the ending I thought was so interesting. It was very creative, I thought. Well, thank you. Thank you. That ending was a last minute addition. I wouldn't have, I didn't see it going there. Uh, yeah, well, that's what a lot of people were saying is, is it, it, the book originally ended where when he goes through the portal and that's it. That's the mm -hmm. end of the whole book. And my editor said to me, because that bit was originally going to be a short story, that, that oh, the last okay. three chapters of the book were originally going to be a short story that I published outside of the book. And my editor said to me, you know, I think maybe this is a trilogy, not just a one-off. And I said, oh, okay, so I have this bit that should be the beginning of the next book then. And she was like, no, I think that bit needs to be at the end of the first book. Um, so it's, but like I said, is you write everything and then you go back and you rewrite it to make it look like it was supposed to be that way the whole time. So I'm glad that you think that that ending is the correct ending and, and, yeah. <laughs> and that it works because it wasn't originally the ending. Well, after reading it, I couldn't really see how else you could have done it. I guess you've probably got a hundred variations, but mm -hmm. from my perspective, I thought that's probably the best possible ending. And it was happy. Yes, yeah, yeah, which is important for me because I want it to be satisfying. Um, and not everybody has to end well, but the book has to end in a satisfying way, so that's good. And we were just talking about the convention center. It's set at that convention center. Okay. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it.